get the program started now. Thank you. In 1998, a softball career like few other began at the University of South Carolina. Megan Matthews had chosen to continue her already legendary career in the upstate by joining Coach Joyce Compton's Gamecock program. And to say she had an immediate impact on the college scene would be a gross understatement. Megan led the nation in saves as a true freshman, but that was only the beginning. She would go on to win an amazing 101 games in her Hall of Fame career. Think about the magnitude of that statement for just a moment. Megan Matthews not only led the country in saves, but she also won 101 games. By the end of her career, Megan was Carolina's all-time leader in strikeouts, complete games, and innings pitch. She was a Gamecock record seven-time SEC Player of the Week, a three-time All-Southeast Region player, twice was named to the All-SEC team, and capped it off by being named an All-American. She was named SEC Tournament MVP in 2000 after pitching every inning of every game and leading Carolina to the championship. She finished her career in the SEC's all-time top 10 in the following categories, appearances, innings pitched, strikeouts, saves, victories, shutouts, complete games, and earn run average. At the time of her graduation, Megan ranked number 11 in NCAA history in strikeouts with 1,090. She was named Carolina's Female Student Athlete of the Year in 2002 and helped lead the Gamecocks to four straight NCAA regional tournament appearances. She was also a member of the Eastern Division Champs three times and, as previously mentioned, led South Carolina to the SEC tournament title in 2002. Ladies and gentlemen, Let's welcome to the University of South Carolina's Athletic Hall of Fame, Megan Matthews. And to be perfectly official, Dr. Megan Matthews Bunning. Congratulations. Well, since we're being honest, we forgot that I also hold the record for most hit batters. And I think when I hit, I actually have the record for the most strikeouts as a hitter. So, um, but thank you for having me here tonight. I, you know, everyone keeps asking me, how do I feel? And I've been thinking about this for a while. I really, I can't put it into words. So I thought that I would come up with just a list of words to give you an idea. One is I feel speechless. Um, I feel surreal. I feel shocked. I feel proud. I feel thankful. I feel grateful. And I feel very humbled. Um, I wish that something like this could come with a plaque that included everybody's name that helped get me here because this certainly was not an individual achievement by, by any means. See, because I never was and I'm not the most talented natural athlete. I mean, for many reasons, I'm not a clowning. Um, <laughs> it took a lot of hard work and a lot of support. And there's so many people to thank. But first and foremost, I have to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for not only for the skills that he gave me, but for the people he put in my life to support and guide me. I have to thank my parents, Chuck and Brenda Langston and my little sister Mackenzie. They had endless, tireless, persistent support. They had so many sacrifices from the time I started in, in sixth grade. Uh, one was carrying my little sister Mackenzie as a baby to, to games. And let me just tell you, I have a four-year-old and that is not an easy task. Um, they provided money for lessons. Uh, they caught for me. I remember when I was in seventh grade, my mom was pregnant. Uh, and I'm not really sure if I should say this, but she was about eight months pregnant and was still catching for me. Um, <laughs> and you know, they pushed me even when I wanted to quit. And they let me quit for those two days. And it helped me realize how much I loved the sport. And they instilled strong values in me and with just an insatiable will to win and strong discipline and work ethic. My dad, 
Mike Matthews <clears throat> for the game knowledge and the wisdom that he gave me. He was a constant fan and a heckler. And he helped me realize that it's a game. It's not life or death. And he taught me how, in most cases, to play like a guy, to go all out and forget the drama. Not that I was successful all the time. I have so many uh, family members and friends, my grandparents. Uh, you know, I have to say that all of my grandfathers are up in heaven, but they have the best seat. Rosie and Charlie, I remember hearing stories about how they loaned my parents money when we were younger, or when I was younger, to help um, just so I could play rec ball and buy equipment that I had that I needed. Uh, Jimmy and Mary Ann Matthews, they helped me understand the game. They were almost at every ball game that I played, and they listened to me, but they, con they constantly stayed positive. My Aunt Linda and my Uncle Lloyd, um, tons of laughs and really good food. I mean, you've got to feed an athlete like myself. And they helped get my grandparents here to ball games. For Bobby and Edith Smith, I think they were at 90% of all of my games for the four years that I played in college. They had unconditional love and just honest, pure belief in me and exuberance in my success. And matter of fact, I believe that all of my granddaddies are my guardian angels. My husband, Sean, he actually is um, a Gamecock as well, and he keeps talking about when he will be admitted into the Athletic Trainers Hall of Fame. So I'll just throw that out there for anybody. <laughs> He helped me on the field, but he challenged me and understood my struggles, and he entered my life at a very difficult time, and I credit a large part of my late success to him, and he continues to be an emotional pillar and just rock in my life. To Jimmy and Jenny Collins, they were my surrogate parents when I was here, and they still are. They gave me lots of laugh and support, but most importantly, they showed me love. And to Coach Compton, one of the few people who to this day knows how to push me and get the best out of me. You taught me life lessons on the field and you taught me how to push through fatigue but you allowed me to lead like I, knew, like I needed to lead. And you had confidence in me and you gave me the ball. And you fought for us as a team but for softball. And for that I am forever grateful. My teammates, they picked me up when they, when they needed and they pushed me when I was needed to be pushed. Every teammate and coach I had from the time I started in the sixth grade through senior year had a part in shaping me as a player and as an athlete and as a person. To my dear friend and teammate, Adriana Baguetta, who made the trip from Iowa just to be here, she was only one of the five that started with us in the freshman class that finished, and she's always been a Megan believer. And I knew she was gonna do everything she could to make a play or produce a run. Each alumni that came before me paved the way for me. The hard work that they did laid a foundation and it built a legacy for Carolina softball. I even have to thank the athletes that I played against because they made me better. And I know that somebody out there nominated me for this and I wanna say thank you to you, whoever you are. I have to thank the administration and the coaches that were here before and during my time, especially Coach Tanner and Coach Compton. <clears throat> I mean, let's face it, they've been Gamecocks since the university was built, right? <laughs> but seriously, those are the people that helped create a specific culture and an expectation of what being a Gamecock athlete was and still is. Carolina always has been a, and has a reputation of discipline, nerves of steel, and fierce competition, but always class. And when I came here as an 18-year-old girl, I slid into an environment that matched the value system that my parents had placed for me. And I can't tell you how many times I use the skills every day from the way that I speak to people, handle situations, and think about life. So this experience was more than just softball. It laid the foundation for my academic success and shaped my character. So you see, this honor really isn't about me. This is about each and every one of you that has contributed to my success and enabled me. <clears throat> it isn't, and it, if you think about it, it's just amazing to think about how many people it takes to, to get somebody to this place. It really does take a village. So to my Gamecock family, I'm so honored to be recognized as a Gamecock for life. From here, I make a commitment to pay it forward and be the type of supporter you have been for me. So thank you and God bless.
Congratulations, Megan. I'm so glad you already used the term total class. I won't have to echo that. Thank you for already doing that for us. Okay, now our second inductee. It is rare indeed. It is, of course, the ultimate to win a collegiate national championship. But University of South Carolina track and field coach Curtis Fry can certainly lay claim to having done exactly that for the Gamecocks. Coach Fry would be the first to tell you that to accomplish that, good coaching and hard work are major factors, but recruiting is the lifeblood of a program. Which brings us to a very special young lady named Charmaine Howell. A native of Kingston, Jamaica, she cast her lot with the Gamecocks in 1997 after winning the National Junior College Championship in the 400 meters in 96. Since her early teens, Charmaine has excelled in the 400 and 800 meters, the 1500 meters, and 4x400 meter relay. During her senior year at Carolina, Charmaine finished as the runner-up to USA Olympian Hazel Clark in both the indoor and outdoor NCAA championships, earning her two-time All-America honors. In fact, she and teammate Tonique Williams were the first females to gain All-America status in track and field at South Carolina. Then came the crowning achievement. Representing her homeland of Jamaica, Charmaine Howell captured a silver medal in the 4x400 relay at the 2000 Olympics in Sydney. It is with great pleasure that we welcome tonight into the USC Athletic Hall of Fame, Charmaine Howell. And to correct something that, that I aired on, on the audio there, there have been field event All-Americans, but the first track All-Americans were Tonique and Charmaine Howell. And now, Charmaine Howell. Wow, what an honor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Special guest. It's just a tremendous honor to stand here tonight. <clears throat> I want to thank each and every one for coming out and supporting me tonight. But first of all, I want to um, take the moment to congratulate my fellow inductees, Dr. Bunning, as we just see, just went through here, Chris, Max, Dave, the late Jake, and the late Arlo. I am very proud to be among this outstanding class of inductees. There is no greater joy in life than seeing others blossom and grow and reach their full potential. Whatever achievements I have earned over the course of my life, they're, um, they're not due to me, they're due to so many people in my life. The values and skills taught by my family, friends, teachers, coaches, mentors, were very fundamental into shaping me into the person that I am today and also as a track athlete. I want to say thank you to the people actually that have shaped and helped me to the, um, into the foundation and fundamental that I am today. And um, as I look around, I see so many great leaders in here tonight. See Errol White over here, um, Coach D, Mama Fry over here. She, she was the one that take care of me whenever I'm in trouble. Mama Fry was always there. Dry my little tears. <laughs> but um, 
I just want to thank everybody. But first of all, I want to go ahead and um, thank my biggest fan. My biggest fan is my family. And um, without my family, I would not be standing here tonight. Um, my family were not able to make it here tonight, but I do have a backup family. <laughs> And they're actually sitting over there. They're my um, Security Federal Bank family. We got Miss Gabby, Kathy, Roma, Wendy, Kathleen, and Miss Audrey. They're all here to support me tonight. So guys, I thank you so much. Um, See, Coach Fry is here tonight. <laughs> Coach Fry has always been a part of my life ever since I got here to the University of South Carolina. Without Coach Fry, I don't think I would have actually graduated and have a degree. Um, I went to school for two years in a very small community college. Great Bend, Kansas, not sure if anybody heard of that. But it was just a small little town. Basically, there was really nothing to do. There was only like a skating ring out there. That was the only fun stuff you could get into out there. But um, when I transferred here to um, USC, wow. You know, every week on campus, there was a party. Woo. I was like, whoa, I didn't know that kind of life exists. <laughs> so, you know, I was just so excited and got a little bit carried away in partying. And actually, my grades were starting to slip. And Coach Fry stepped in and he got with my academic advisor and he sit me down and he said, Charmaine, your sister's senior year. And when she's senior year, she told me to take good care of you. And Coach Fry worked everything out. I was failing accounting. I guess I could admit that's a class I was failing. And um, Coach Fry actually get me into um, summer school. And guess what? I made 4.0. <laughs> but um, without Coach Fry's support, I really don't think I would have actually made it through. So Coach Fry, thank you for that. Uh, so, another important thing that I want to talk about that Coach Fry taught me was um, teamwork. Coach Fry said to me, there is no I, no I in team. He said, being a part of a Gamecock team is a privilege. And each member of the team has a responsibility to be a better person not just today, but to be the day after and the day next to come. Not as an athlete, but more as an individual or a person. So Coach Fry, thank you for that. And I know you would be proud because I've actually applied teamwork to my daily life. So thank you again. I also want to thank my collegiate and um, Olympic coach, Andrew, Andrew Alden, and he's sitting right over here. <sighs> Andrew Alden, to me, very charismatic and influential leader. Um, he not only helped me to continue grow my portfolio and accomplishment, but he has encouraged me. And um, basically, I could tell a short story. Um, the year 1999, I remember that year clearly because um, it was a very important year for me, actually. Um, it was the year of the Olympics. I'm sorry, not the Olympics, but the World Championship Games. And um, it was also the year I graduated from USC. So basically, um, 
That year I competed um, for Team Jamaica in Seville, Spain, and um, I did not do very well. So I was, um, I was crushed. I, I was, you know, but the first thing on my mind was I let down my teammate and, and my um, fellow members. But um, Coach, Coach Alden has encouraged me to um, keep it going. I can do better and, and to move on. In closing, I also want to forward a thanks to Coach Tanner for his commitment to improve the indoor and outdoor tracks. And uh, I just want to say thank you guys and for everybody that have selected me into the committee. Thank you. Postseason baseball began for the University of South Carolina in 1974. And in 1975, Bobby Richardson's Gamecocks made it to Collegiate Baseball's Promised Land, the College World Series in Omaha. Head coaches June Raines, Ray Tanner, and Chad Holbrook have continued that tradition of excellence. The Gamecocks have now appeared in 11 College World Series and are the second winningest college baseball team in the country since 2000. A vital cog along the way was a catcher from York, Pennsylvania by the name of Chris Boyle who lettered for Coach Reigns from 1981 through 84. With Chris behind the plate, Carolina was an NCAA tournament team all four seasons, and he helped lead the Gamecocks to two of those 11 College World Series. Until 1994, Chris Boyle was the Gamecocks' all-time leader and runs batted in with 198. A player who would one day himself be elected to the Hall of Fame, center fielder Mack White would tie Chris's RBI record in that 1994 season and those two former Gamecocks would hold tightly to that RBI record until it was broken by current major leaguer Justin Smoke in 2008. Along with sharing second all-time in runs batted in, Chris Boyle belted 43 home runs, good enough for sixth in the Carolina record book. 224 base hits, 43 homers, 198 runs batted in, and a 292 career batting average, and an outstanding catcher. Yes, York, Pennsylvania's Chris Boyle is indeed a Hall of Famer. That's welcome, Chris Boyle. mentioned Tommy was I was the first person to hit three home runs in one game as well. I wasn't sure if you guys knew that. But before I get started, I would like to congratulate uh, Coach Dawn Staley on her nomination or her induction to the National Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, Mass. <laughs> I have been to Springfield, Mass and been to the Hall of Fame and it is certainly an outstanding place and I congratulate her. I told my wife I wasn't going to wear the glasses, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's an honor for me to have the opportunity to let you guys know how humbled, honored, thankful, and blessed I am to stand up here. I want to thank the Hall of Fame committee for this evening. Truthfully, I have never been real excited about individual awards, accolades, and whatnot, but I assure you I embrace this with open arms and will cherish the rest of my life. To be remembered by the committee, nearly 30, 30 years after graduation is indeed special. Uh, I was always reflect on this occasion with great pride. Uh, playing baseball at South Carolina has had a significant impact on my life, and Columbia is a special place to me. Some of my closest friends today were teammates of mine when I was playing baseball in, uh, at South Carolina. Um, <clears throat> the contacts I made in college are the same friends and contacts that propelled me into the career I have in the business I currently own. I was married in Columbia, my wife's from Columbia. All three of my children were born and raised in Columbia. 
I was married in Columbia, and I've lived here for over 25 years. This is definitely a special place. I thank everyone who guided me and supported me during my career, including Coach Reigns. I'm not sure if Coach Reigns is here. Um, I remember the very first phone call and how excited I was. I remember having the opportunity to play in a College World Series, and we did twice. We weren't winning national championships like they are today, but I like to think that we were setting the table. Coach Reigns, I'm not sure how many games I have won or lost for you, but I do know I helped your graduation ring. <laughs> Coach White's help. <laughs> uh, I remember uh, my recruiting trip down here and how much I loved it. And I even, when I went back to Pennsylvania to tell my, to share my excitement and joy with my parents and South Carolina is a place I wanted to go. It's where I wanted to play baseball. And uh, my mom jokingly asked me if I was going to develop a Southern accent uh, when I come home at Christmas time. And I kind of stopped and I said, mom, after my visit down in South Carolina last year, I don't know about a Southern accent from what I saw, chances are it would be a Southern belle. <laughs> <laughs> I had heard from so many people throughout my life, including high school and into college, that the two most important things that a young person can make is the college they attend and the person they marry. I guess in baseball terms, you could say I was two for two with three RBIs. <laughs> I might even give myself a stolen base since I never had any in college. Unfortunately, my wife never had a chance to take a single at bat in college. But after 13 years of marriage, she's probably heard of most of them. <laughs> the two best coaches I have ever had in my life are my mom and dad. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have them here with me uh, here today. Um, after hearing about this induction, I was so excited, of course, but I was more excited that my mother and father were going to get to travel to Columbia from Pennsylvania with six kids and 20 grandchildren who were all fighting over their time and their visits. So, but for some reason, they seemed to spend more time in Maui, Hawaii, visiting my brother and sister <laughs> who live out there full time. But you guys are welcome here. I would also like to congratulate my parents who just three weeks ago celebrated their 56th wedding anniversary. So that's certainly remarkable. Obviously, my parents taught me the meaning of dedication, commitment, hard work, and the power of prayer. Uh, the Christian values, the family values that I was raised in by my mom and dad are certainly the values that I try to raise my children today. I'd like to welcome my sister Dana and her husband Joe. Dana was a basketball player here 1981, 82, whenever it was, but it's good to see her, and I appreciate you guys coming. Now, in closing, I would like to share a poignant memory uh, that happened 29 years ago, my senior year of college. And that was a tragic loss of my sister-in-law, Bobby Rossi. Uh, I never met Bobby. I never spoke to Bobby. I never gave Bobby a hug like I do the rest of the Rossi's family. However, I feel like I know Bobby. There are two scholarships in Columbia that bear Bobby's name, one at Cardinal Newman High School and the other one at the College of Nursing here at, here at USC. <clears throat> I ask you that you remember my mother-in-law, Anne Marie Rossi, during this time of year. My mother-in-law is probably the strongest willed, most determined, dignified woman I may have ever met in my life. And the best thing I like about her is she always lets me have the last word in conversations, and that's yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you so much, and God bless. One of the all-time greats, Chris Boyle. In 1956, Don Larson incredibly pitched a perfect game for the New York Yankees and the World Series against the Brooklyn Dodgers, and superstar Mickey Mantle won baseball's Triple Crown. Amazingly, college football's Heisman Trophy was won by a player on a 2-8 team, Paul Horning of Notre Dame. At the University of South Carolina, Warren Gazet was hired to replace the legendary Rex Enright. But another important event occurred in South Carolina in 1956. On March 24th, to be exact, in Greenwood, long considered one of the football hotbeds of the Southeast, Max Culp Runniger was born. 
and after a great high school career at Orangeburg Wilkinson, Max decided that he would cast his lot with Paul Dietzel at the University of South Carolina, and as they say, the rest is history. Jim Carlin replaced Coach Dietzel in 1975, and at about the same time, Max Rundiger's career flourished. He averaged over 41 yards per punt for his Gamecock career and holds the Carolina record for a single game punting average with 47 yards per punt in a game. That is with a minimum of 10 punts in the ball game. And that was a miraculous 18-17 win over Ole Miss in 1978. Two years earlier, Max Runniger and Ole Miss legend Jim Miller staged one of the great punting duels in the history of williams Bryce Stadium and it was another nail-biter won by Carolina 10-7 over the Rebels. Picked in the eighth round of the 1979 NFL Draft, Max began a pro career that proved his college exploits were no fluke. He was the Super Bowl punter for both the Philadelphia Eagles and the San Francisco 49ers in a career that spanned 11 seasons. In 1992, Max was voted as the punter on Carolina's all-time team and in 2007 was elected to the State of South Carolina Athletic Hall of Fame. And tonight, September 12, 2013, please welcome for induction into the University of South Carolina's Athletic Hall of Fame, Mr. Max Runniger. Induction, excuse me, kind of reminds me of that dachshund sniffing around that fire hydrant. By golly, I believe that's me. Um, <clears throat> it is an absolute honor to be standing in front of you today. Uh, an honor that I never thought, really never thought about, because being a punter, sort of like being a caddy on the golf course. You know, you don't see them a whole lot, except when they're really needed. You better do your job or you're not going to be there for very long. And it has just, it's been a great ride. It was to be a walk on in 1974 with eight other punters. And they had just lost their punter, Robbie Reynolds. And they had this guy, Jeff Grants, that quarterback some and wanted to try and punt. But um, he was going to be their punter. Of course, when I came in, I was back then they had the freshman team. And not very many freshmen played on the varsity. And I was lucky enough to uh, beat out a lot of the other eight walk-on punters. And after a good game and a good win against Clemson for the freshman team, Jeff had apparently gotten hurt uh, in the football game prior to that. And Coach Dietzel came into the locker room after our, our freshman game and said, um, Max, I'd like for you to punt for the varsity. I said, well, could you give me a couple of days to think about it? <laughs> um, that, and that's pretty much where it started right there. But, <clears throat> you know, the, the selection committee, number one, I want to say thank you very much. Um, when Tommy called and said that I had been nominated and selected, it, it Truly a great honor. I had two, um, two brothers that were in school here. Uh, we had been South Carolina fans forever. And to be able to walk out and be a part of this great university, uh, you know, just meant the world to me. And I, this guy behind, you, behind all of you is holding this sign up, you know, telling me how much time I have left. Well, let me tell you. I only had three minutes a game on the field. So I'm not going to let him tell me how much time I have here. I mean, that's total. That's total playing time that I had. Most of it was spent on the sidelines. So let me get this out. Um, kind of reminds me of the first snap that I ever took as a walk-on. Actually, it was right in this end zone. And it was back when we had to register. Of course, Coach White remembers this uh, vividly. We only had half the stadium lights done because 
we had to pl practice like at 5.30 in the morning so Coach White could get us all organized so we could go register for classes. Well, Coach Diesel called me up to come up there and punt. And we were in tight punt formation. It means the ball's on the one yard line. Q Bell was a snapper, a left-handed snapper. I'd never caught a snap before. What do I do? I drop it. As I'm walking by, that guy I just mentioned, Jeff Grant, said, why don't you just go to school and forget about this? <laughs> I'll never forget it, Jeff. <laughs> but I knew right then and there that I could do this job, and I wanted to do it very well. After I finished, I ended up lettering as a freshman. Coach Diesel retired. Jim Carlin came in, and he told me about the same thing. He said, I got a couple of punters coming through. Um, be best for you just to get your education and not, what, you know, not worry about football. I said, Coach, you're going to have to run me away from here. He said, because I know I can punt. Of course, him being a punter himself, you know, well, he always wanted kind of challenge. So we, we had a few kickoffs, but he wanted consistency. And that's something that I get to in a minute with my parents. But if I started talking about them right now, there wouldn't be a dry seat in the house. I mean, a dry eye in the house. <clears throat> um, but it, this is South Carolina we're talking to, right? Come on, you got to be a little quicker than that. Um, <clears throat> but it has just been a phenomenal career. It was a phenomenal career here. And the people that I want to thank, number one, Coach Dietzel for giving me an, the first opportunity, Coach Carlin for believing me, in me and giving me the second opportunity, and Harold White, who was my kicking coach throughout, worked me along the lines to say, hang in there. Because as a, when I was still paying my way, or my parents were paying my way through school as a sophomore, and they told me I was going to redshirt, I said, well, how are they going to redshirt me when I'm still I'm paying for my college? I said, well, just hang in there. You know, they got plans for you. Well, those plans came to fruition. And to be a walk-on and a team captain, a four-year letterman, I take a lot of pride in that because I tried to set a, a, step, a level of excellence and that the University of South Carolina had and I wanted to achieve with them. To my mother and father, uh, who's from every level, has been, uh, been right there for me. I don't think they've missed hardly any games, be it sitting in the cold, frigid 25 below in Philadelphia, to rainy in Wake Forest, uh, when my grandmother, this was the only game she got to see me play, she's sitting up there all bundled up in the rain and cold. But they were all the, always there for me. Uh, as an ex-coach, uh, he, he believed wholeheartedly in hard work. And he was out there every time I wanted to go. He would drop everything. <clears throat> he taught me to stay within myself, don't kick for the oohs and ahs, and better things would work out. My mother, to raise five kids without a washing machine, you know, was pretty, pretty strong work ethic there. So to my brother, Pat, who I learned to catch snaps from, and trust me, <laughs> The rest of it was easy after you, uh, well, then I got to Tom N.J. Chalk, who was, uh, you know, I don't know which was, uh, which was really snapping to me. Or one was high, one was low most of the time. Um, to my sister Jane and their families and my family and friends that have been, that are here tonight to support me are just, I can't exp express my thank you for the years that they followed me. Uh, to a young lady, Melissa, that has given me a new lease on life and reinvigorated uh, me as a person, as an individual, I thank you. It has just, I mean, the times here that spin out on this field, running these stadium steps, to, to be able to come in here tonight and say thank you as fans for supporting the teams through lean years and now through great years. My unfortunate part was the 11 years that I missed during some pretty good times when I was playing in the NFL. And the only thing with the NFL I guess I can leave is I'm the highest paid per player play, highest paid per player per play in two Super Bowls. <laughs> I only punted three times in each Super Bowl and I got the same amount as Joe Montana did. <laughs> so I feel pretty honored for that. But again, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart 
that uh, Coach White, with all the missteps, the guided steps, the one thing that I always remember, because I went into his office quite a bit uh, academically, not as much athletically, but uh, he was there with us all day long. And he always had a plaque hanging up in his office. And he said, it comes a time in every athlete's life <clears throat> that the cheers stop, the laurel wreaths wither, and the applause belongs to others. And you hate to give up that time. You hate for that time to arrive, but and a lot of times you don't have a say-so in it. I didn't. I wish I was still playing, making the money they're making today. But that, that always stuck with me. And Coach White and I, we were out here many a days working by ourselves, working with the kickers and the punters, and he just did a phenomenal job, and I thank you from the bottom. And he got me out of school as well, which was pretty important. Um, and the last thing I'd like to leave with you in a little daily devotion I read every, every morning is when you're not at your best, God is. Thank you very much, and God bless you. One of the great From the years in 2000 through 2002, Ray Tanner's Gamecock baseball program won an incredible 162 games, an average of 54 wins per season. Only once in 108 years of playing baseball had South Carolina won 50 or more games, that being in 1975. A major step forward for Coach Tanner's program was the recruitment of shortstop Drew Meyer out of Charleston's Bishop England High School. And after painful three to two losses kept the Gamecocks from reaching the College World Series in both 2000 and 2001, Meyer and his teammates staged a comeback for the ages at Sarge Fry Field on June 9, 2002. The Gamecocks finally did win that elusive Super Regional Championship over Miami by a six to four score with Drew Meyer playing a prominent role in the Sarge Fry miracle. Not only did Carolina play in the College World Series for the first time since 1985, they went all the way to the title game with a school record 57 wins. And not only was Drew Meyer voted first team all SEC in 2002, but was named a first team all American by Baseball America, Collegiate Baseball, and the American Baseball Coaches Association. In that 02 season, Drew set an SEC record that still stands today, 120 base hits in a single season. There have been literally thousands of baseball players who played in the Southeastern Conference, but only one, Drew Meyer, has recorded that many hits in one season. Being blessed with tremendous range as a shortstop, Drew possessed arguably the greatest throwing arm of any infielder in Gamecock history. He also was able to live the dream of many a ball player when he spent time in the major leagues after being a first round draft choice of the Texas Rangers. All-American Hall of Famer, Drew Meyer. Well, my part in the Sarge Fry miracle was not swinging. Uh, they had a lefty pitching. Um, it was a tied game, and he had me down to two strikes. All he had to do is throw it somewhere near the zone, and I'm hacking at it. And uh, threw it to the backstop twice, and we picked up a 6-4 lead and uh, got to Omaha. So if that's my part in the miracle, I'll take it. <laughs> Some tremendous speeches here tonight, and a common threshold is thanking people. And that's, that's what I want to do tonight. Coach Tanner taught me one thing in my career. Keep your speeches short. <laughs> so thank you to the Letterman's Association and the Gamecock Club for all you've done for us. This is a tremendous night, a special night and weekend for us and our family, and we really do appreciate it. So why did I choose USC? Well, like many other athletes in this room, we had options of where we could go attend college and get our degrees. We went through the recruiting process, and I narrowed it down to two places, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, Chad Holbrook, in the University of South Carolina, Ray Tanner. So how did I choose Ray Tanner over Chad Holbrook? Because he chose Chad Holbrook. Well, one main reason is Gamecock Nation and the fans. I, I could see the, the effort here. I came to football games when they couldn't even win a game, and it was still packing the house. And I'm like, geez, what if they can win some games? What is this place going to look like? <laughs> Another reason is Ray Tanner and the passion he showed 
for what he believed in and how to build a winning program. And, and we bought right into it, me and my family, and it was an easy, easy, easy decision. And I want to thank you for showing that to me and bringing me along and, and having trust in me. You also promised me a new stadium my freshman year. <laughs> I came in in 1999, so if you can do the math, that shows you how recruiting goes. I do want to take this time to thank, thank some people behind the scenes. After I got done with my playing career, Coach Tanner graciously let me come on a Gamecock coaching staff. And it kind of taught me some things of how much hard work goes into getting these student athletes on the field. And it, when you're going through this and you're going through college and going all the classes, you kind of take for granted of the people that don't really, you see out in the dugout or on the TV. And just a few of those people. Charles Anderson, our strength coach. I probably need to get back to working with him. Jason Pappas, our academic advisor. Christy Davis in the baseball office. Brainerd Cooper, trainer, and all the other athletic trainers. I know they had to work a lot on me to get me on the field and make sure I was ready to go. Our head doctor, Ron Casper. John Dudley and Dave Godovin, our equipment managers. That's just a short list of people that nobody knows about. And they, they work every day to get us on that field. And I want to take that time to thank you. I want to thank my teammates. This was not done alone. Specifically, Trey Dyson, sitting right there. I know he wanted a shout out. <laughs> we pushed each other to no end. That season, my freshman year, we went 50 and 6 in the regular season. We refused to believe we could lose, and we rarely did. Guys like Kip Balknight, Peter Barber, Peter Bauer, Scott Barber, the Killer Bees. It was just talk about a joy to play defense. I mean, just score a couple runs, and hey, they'll take care of the rest. We, you know, got upset at losses, but we celebrated with wins on Sunday night and, and five points, Coach Jenner. That's where we used to celebrate our Sunday nights. <laughs> After SEC weekend sweeps, you know, you could find us down there. I want to thank the coaches. My freshman year, we had Fox Beyer, who was a student assistant coach, and I think Coach Jenner strategically placed him as my sweet mate at the roost to try to maybe, you know, keep me calm. It, it worked. Um, Stuart Lake down at Charleston Southern, Jim Toman up at Liberty, Jerry Myers, who we're very lucky to have back here at South Carolina as our pitching coach. We can't let him go again. And Ray Tanner. And Coach Tanner, I'm going to throw your wife Karen Tanner in there. Because there's no way you could handle us all on your own. I know you had to go home to somebody that could talk some sense into you. You know, one, one cool thing I have uh, in common with Coach Tanner is I got to be part of his first and last trips to Omaha. I'm also part of both national championship series that we lost. So I think that's kind of why he retired. He said, if you're going to stick around, I might need to, I might need to move on because I can't win with you in the dugout. So. But coach, you, you've meant so much to me. You believed in me as a 17-year-old ball player and again as a 30-year-old coach. And I just appreciate everything you've done for me. You've, you've taught me to be a better man, better player, better student. I left college, not the best of grades. I've had other things on my mind and came back and I think it's all him, but he, he got me to be a 4.0 student, so. I want to thank my siblings. Steven here tonight. If you watched any of the College World Series, he was the one walking around with a chicken hat on and trying to be on ESPN at every possible moment. <laughs> my older brother David and sister Karen, they couldn't be here tonight out of town, but I appreciate all the support you all have given me and you've always been so proud. And when I did come home, you did let me know I'm still your brother. To my beautiful wife, Christy, and my precious son, Hudson. I don't know uh, how you do it. You put up with our hectic schedules and decisions, and you supported me from changing professional teams to quitting professional baseball to going back to school at South Carolina to coaching at South Carolina to not coaching at South Carolina, and then now is my career as a federated insurance salesman. <laughs> and I appreciate you. You've made me the happiest man alive, and I love you. And to my parents. They put that sign up again for the time limit, and they're lucky because I could sit here all night and all day and talk about how much they mean to me and how much I thank you for everything you've done. Dad hit me ground ball after ground ball after ground ball after ground ball. He didn't stop Sunday afternoon, never stopped. That made me who I am today, and I appreciate it. You made sacrifices that no man could dream of, and I, I, I appreciate it, and I love you for that. Mom, I love you. Coach Tanner just notified me before this thing started that you did call him every day while I was in college to check up on me. 
And funny thing is, I, I knew that all along. There's no way I knew she'd just let me be out on my own like that. But uh, you've been there taking me from playground to park to playground to park, driving me to practice, shaking pom-poms, even Coke cans with pennies in them to make noise in high school baseball. But I love you. You followed me all around the country and supported everything I've done. You know, you give me a kick in the rear when I need it and a pat on the back when I wanted it. So I love you and thank you for everything. And that's all I got, guys. Go Cox. Let's get a win. Thanks, Drew, and congratulations. Out of Hudson Falls, New York, offensive tackle Dave DiCamilla lettered for Paul Dietzel's Gamecocks from 1968 through 1970. He helped to anchor an explosive offense for all three of those seasons. Only one South Carolina player made first team all ACC in both 1969 and 1970, Dave DiCamilla, one of the great linemen in Gamecock history. Dave would be disappointed if we failed to recognize his teammates who also made first team all-conference in that two-year period. On the all-ACC team in 1969, he was joined by defensive tackle Jimmy Poston, defensive back Pat Watson, kicker Billy Dupree, flanker Freddie Ziegler, quarterback Tommy Suggs, and all-American fullback Warren Muir. In 1970, the first team honors were handed out to Dave again, along with explosive flanker Jimmy Mitchell and all-American Dickie Harris from the secondary and, of course, of kick return fame. But as special as all ACC honors were, they played second fiddle to what Dave DiCamilla and his Gamecock mates accomplished in 1969. University of South Carolina was a member of the ACC from 1953 until exiting in 1971. One time did the Gamecocks win the conference championship in football, and they did it with perfection in 1969, going 6-0. Those USC players who began as freshmen in 1967 also never lost to the Clemson Tigers. One of the greatest of them all was our new Hall of Famer, offensive tackle who traveled from the Golden State of California to be with us, Dave DiCamillo. daughter's party comments were, Dad, don't make a fool of yourself. So I'll try not to. Thank you. First of all, let me uh, echo everyone else's thoughts in thanking the Letterman's Association and the Gamecock Club for this uh, fabulous event. And the reason I, I understand it more than when I was a 20-year-old kid is my f real first job was uh, uh, assistant football coach at Carroll College in Waukesha, Wisconsin. I had the freshman team who was to go to Lawrence College for a four o'clock ball game, and I forgot to order the bus. So the kids are waiting there, and there's no bus. And I went, holy Toledo, there's a lot more to this. And then all of a sudden, everything fell into place, what it takes to put on a ball game, an event, to keep the Letterman's Club going to, to this great uh, process. So again, I'm thoroughly floored. I'm very grateful and uh, thank you to everybody. I'll keep my remarks short. Um, I've never been a big one for, always had difficulty with individual honors in a team sport. And I always think of Fran Leibowitz who said, all modesty is false. And I, and I am very grateful and very lucky. And what I wanted to do is just enumerate why I am lucky. I'm lucky because in 1967, I bust out of the United States Military Academy. Paul Dietzel calls me up and says, Dave, come on down to South Carolina, and you can play down here. Books, board, tuition, the whole nine yards. I didn't even know where South Carolina was, to be perfectly honest. I had the greatest four years of my life. Uh, it, it, it was fat, just a tremendous experience. So I'm lucky on that score. I'm lucky because it you, at West Point, I never blocked anybody. I was a linebacker. My, my linebacker coach was Bill Parcells. Well, Bill Shalosky 
was the best coach I ever had because he taught me how to block. I didn't, I wasn't an offensive lineman. Didn't, didn't know even how to do it. So I'm, I'm lucky on that score. I had, a, I had a tremendous line coach. I'm lucky because in 1968, we get inside the six yard line on Clemson, I don't know how many times. We can't, I mean, if anybody was at the game, I'm sorry, it was awful. I still get Christmas cards from the Clemson defensive linemen thanking me because I never blocked anybody. <laughs> We, we, we couldn't get it. We could not get in the end zone. But fortunately, we had a great defensive back, Tyler Hellams. And if you can get the uh, record, Tyler, I hope he has it. It's uh, Bob Fulton. Hellams back at the 35-yard line to catch the punt. Tyler returns the punt. We win the ball game 7-3, and it set the stage in the 1968 game. That punt return really set the stage for our 69 season um, in which we had, I'm lucky because we had Suggs to Ziegler, or yeah, Suggs to Ziegler. That's Tom Suggs throwing the ball to Fred Ziegler. We could score and we could make plays. We had Warren Muir and Rudy Halliman. So as an offensive lineman, you need people that can do things like that. So I'm real lucky on that score. Um, I'm lucky because we had two great tight ends. We do uh, what they call post and drive blocking. Well, I had 68 at Johnny Gregory and 69 and 70 at Doug Hamrick. I did the posting, they did all the driving. So we did a lot of double teaming. It wasn't a one man thing. Um, you don't get better unless you practice against good people. Well, I never really played against anybody in the game that was better than Jim Poston, Rusty Gaines, or uh, our defensive end, uh, Joe Wingard. I never blocked him, ever. He was 6'4", he was a high jumper in high school, he was a f phenomenal athlete. So I was able to get things done because of my teammates. It wasn't anything, I was just very fortunate in that score. And finally, um, one other thing, in, that, in the 1969 season, we're on the ropes at Virginia Tech. Uh, again, Suggs to Ziegler, we move down the field, we get in field goal range, Billy Dupree kicks a 47-yard field goal with nine seconds left, and we win the ball game. We go 6-0. and um, I wouldn't have made all-conference if we hadn't, hadn't won that ball game. So uh, we had teammates. Um, we have the best fans around. I, I'm floored. Um, Drew mentioned the year I'm in, in the West Coast. Carolina goes 0-10 and, and they filled the, or I don't know, it was a very poor season. They sold out every game. It's unheard of. That's a tremendous thing. So I owe a lot to the fans. I also owe a lot to my family, my wife, and um, I would have probably ended up in minimum security prison somewhere if it wasn't for her. <laughs> She's been 30 years with a Girl Scout. She's a vice president. She also serves as uh, Northern California ch uh, chapter. She's president of women who are married to Italians. And my sister-in-law has the Charleston chapter. They do, you know, group therapy and things like that. My daughter, my daughter too, she, she's an assistant tennis coach at, at um, University of Chicago, and she keeps re reminding me, Dad, tennis is not football. I says, okay, I get it, I get it. So for all of, all of the Carolina family, I'm a, I'll be eternally grateful. I thank you for your support, and if I could, I'd like to ask the 68, 69, and 70 guys to stand up. I know you're out there. Get up. Come on. Stand up. Stand up. They're, they're hiding back there. So with that, I conclude my remarks. I thank you. I love everybody, and I, I can't say enough for the Carolina Nation. Thank you. Thanks to Coach Tanner for his great work. Here you go, Dave. One other thing. The state of West Virginia in the 1950s and 60s was considered prime fertile recruiting territory for the University of South Carolina. In fact, at least two previously inducted Gamecock Hall of Famers, Gary Greger from basketball and Alex Hawkins from football, two professional stars for many years, hail from the Mountaineer State. 
Jake Bodkin's football career following his graduation from South Charleston High School in 1954 took what you might call a slight detour. He joined the United States military with special forces as a paratrooper with the 11th Airborne Division and completed his career with the U.S. Marine Corps. He signed with Warren Gizeh South Carolina Gamecocks in 1957 and was a letterman and starter from 1958 through 1960 as a guard on the Gamecocks forward wall. After being voted to the All-ACC second team as a junior, as well as being first team All-State, Bodkin achieved AP first team All-Conference recognition as a senior, a season that was capped off by winning the prestigious Jacobs Blocking Trophy for the state of South Carolina. He was also co-captain of the Gamecocks. He played in two postseason collegiate All-Star games following his Carolina career, the Copper Bowl and the All-American Bowl. On Christmas Eve 1960, in an article from the Spartanburg Herald, Coach Gizeh probably best summed up Jake Bodkin's career when he stated, Jake's job was to protect our quarterback. No one ever got to our quarterback. He was later drafted by the Buffalo Bills of the American Football League and played for the Bills in 1961. Jake passed away on February 28, 2007 at his home in Prosperity, South Carolina at the age of 70. John J. Jake Bodkin has long been regarded as one of the toughest players ever to don the garnet and black. And we honor him today as a member of the University of South Carolina Athletic Hall of Fame. Accepting on behalf of Jake Bodkin, a great football player in his own right and a great teammate of Jake's, Jerry Fry. First of all, I'd like to congratulate all the inductees that are, were inducted tonight. What a class we have, and uh, it's a great honor, I'm sure, for all of you and your families. So uh, on behalf of uh, my group over here, the old guys, and uh, we'd like to just congratulate you on what went on here tonight with you. Uh, it's certainly an honor for me to accept this award on behalf of Jake. Um, they kind of let me be last, I think, because there's an awful lot of stories about Jake, but I'm not going to get into all that tonight, but uh, we could take up about three days, I believe. But uh, Jake was quite a character, quite a player, one of the greatest teammates you could possibly have, and really a great team player, a great, great team player. I'm accepting tonight on behalf of Jake's family, and Jake's brother is here tonight. Buzz, if you would stand, and his caretaker, Debbie, if y'all would stand over there. They're from South Charleston, West Virginia. Give them a hand. And also, we have a lot of his teammates. I'm going to ask, um, and I'm not going to call them out. I think they got me to do this because I could remember probably better than some of them over there. So uh, if y'all would go ahead and stand, too. This is some of Jake's teammates. He's got, will y'all go ahead and stand? And let's give them a hand also. There's a couple of stories I'd like to tell about Jake. Jake's football powers are, you know, we played both ways there. And uh, I know a lot of you guys don't even know what I'm talking about. That meant you played offense and defense. <laughs> and you ran down on punts and you covered kickoffs. So uh, you got the whole deal. And uh, it was always a lot of fun to see who could get out of running down on kickoffs. So uh, Jake and I perfected that pretty well. We could fake a shoe coming undone or something. but. We didn't do too much about covering kickoffs. But a funny story how Jake and I met. Um, when, I, when we came to school here, Coach Kizé, and I hate Coach is not here tonight. He's not doing very well, but um, he's sure in our thoughts and our prayers. But Jake and I met. We were in a large room. We had about 130 freshmen. This was in 1956. And we were all in the room there, and um, that's when you could recruit. and. You didn't have the same rules you have now. A lot of different rules. So, Ray, this would have been tough to govern, I can tell you that, for, a, for an athletic director.
but you had a lot of different things. We had about 135 kids on scholarship that year. And I was a walk-on, and Jake was here. Really, I know why Jake was here. He was here to look after Alex Hawkins, who was his teammate. And Coach Gizay had got Jake in school, and he, Alex wanted him here, so we got him down here. So we're kind of sizing each other up in the room. We got all these freshmen in there, and I'm, I didn't weigh but about 165 pounds in. And I just happened to look over, and I caught this guy's eye. And he just didn't look like the ordinary freshman to me. And, of course, I didn't know then that he had been in the paratroopers and had about 25 jumps and had been in the Marines. And so Jake and I's introduction was I, he kind of caught me looking at him, and Jake said, what are you looking at? And I looked at him, and I said, and I don't know why I said this. I said, I, I'm looking at you, you big ape. And uh, Jake jumped up, and I said, oh, my gosh. And he ran across the room, and I thought he was going to deck me, but he stuck his hand out, and he said, I'm Jake Botkin. And I said, well, I'm Jerry Fry. So that's how our friendship began. And, uh, but we had a great time with Jake. And um, so Jake was, you know, he was proud to be in the service. He was a proud American, and he was a top-notch football player that could have played in any era. And uh, he was my buddy, and he looked after me, and I tried to look after him. And we had some interesting things, and uh, it went on. And Jake used to tell me, that, you know, I'd get out of line a little bit, and he said, look, I'm going to tell you something, Jerry. He said, when I was out jumping out of airplanes, protecting this country, said you were jumping off the school buses. And he was about right. That's, that was his favorite saying. But Jake was a real team player, a player that gave a great effort all the time. And I'll tell you one other story, and I'm not going to make this long. I could talk about Jake for, for a long, long time. And uh, Jake had a nickname, and I don't know, Tommy, if you got it on there or not, Scrap Iron. He had a nickname called Scrap Iron. And because he was so dadgum tough, but he didn't get it on the football field. We were celebrating the 4th of July one summer. We didn't have a lot to do like kids do now, so we had to drum up all of our own excitement. So we would always go up to Main Street Columbia and join in on the parade at the 4th of July. So we were up parading around, and um, they had the band playing, and so Jake said, well, you know, I think I want to get in that band, the back of that band, and march along. I said, fine, jump in. We had about six of us. Jake jumped out in front of a bus, a city bus. And my goodness, he got knocked about 20 feet in the air, did a halfway flip, and ended up on his feet. And so everybody was on the side of watching the parade. They started clapping, and everybody, Jake never faked her or whatever, so... We just went right on, and we were walking down the street. A guy said, you know, said, hey, he's tougher than scrap iron. He said he doesn't bend or break, and he certainly did. So uh, we, do, we were happy about that. But Jake was quite, he was quite the player. And I'll tell you one other story, and then I'm going to get off of here. In the Georgia game in 1959, Jake came to me right before the game, and he said, Jerry, I want to tell you something. I said, okay. He said, I'm going airborne today. I said, Jake, what in the world are you talking about? I said, you were airborne five years ago. He said, no, I'm going airborne. He said, I'm going to block a kick. And dadgum, if he didn't get out there, Georgia was ranked about number four in the country. They were undefeated. They had a quarterback named Fran Tarkent. And I know you older people will remember Fran Tarkent. And they had a kicker. And Max, I know you remember Bobby Walton who kicked in the pros for all those years, was a great All-American kicker. But Jake said he was going airborne. And he said, you just be around the following football. I'm going to block a kick. Now, the dadgum Jake got in there and blocked that kick and turned that game around, and we beat Georgia 35 to 14, the only game they lost that year. They went 12 and 0, 12 and 1. So, in closing, I would just like to say thank you to all the teammates who helped Jake in his later years. And Jake's failing health, uh, a lot in this group looked after Jake in his home and took care of him. And, when Jake passed away, they did all the funeral arrangements, and you guys are to be thanked for being great teammates that you were because Jake was certainly a good teammate through the years. And I'm honored to be able to accept this for Jake. He was certainly a great friend of mine, and he had been a friend for a number of years, and uh, it's just been you know, great to have had a teammate like that. I hope all you younger people and the ones that have played, and you know, we've got some probably still playing in here, so you know, to have a teammate like Jake Bodkin. And uh, 
I just want to say thank you for Jake being such a great friend and, and being a teammate. And Jake, I hope you're hearing us up there tonight. Thank you. On August 15, 1983, the University of South Carolina made the decision to hire Arlo Elkins as its new head coach for women's tennis. 438 wins later, on February 28, 2012, Arlo retired, leaving a standard of excellence that any university would be proud of. After his initial 12 and 17 season, the Carolina ladies made one of the most astonishing turnarounds ever, going 27 and 10 and winning the first of five Metro Conference championships. Elkins and the Gamecocks won the Metro title the following three years, then once more in 1990, two years before becoming a member of the Southeastern Conference. The fact that in spite of all those conference championships, Carolina under Elkins didn't achieve NCAA tournament status until 1988 makes his accomplishments all the more impressive. Upon his retirement in 2012, his Gamecock women's tennis team had made a staggering 19 NCAA tournament appearances again, all since 1988 and Carolina's streak of 17 bids in a row stood as the 11th longest such streak in the country in 2012. And the list of accolades gets longer and stronger. Of those 17 straight NCAA tournament berths, Elkins Gamecocks advanced to at least the tourney's second round 15 times and the Sweet 16 four times. And 15 times in his prestigious career, Arlo's teams finished ranked in the season's final rankings in the top 25. After his retirement in February 2012, his tennis team made it 18 straight into the big dance. Arlo Elkins did the University of South Carolina proud for 28 years, and he did it with class and dignity. And tonight, we say thank you for a job well done. Also, a big thank you to Tara, Alyssa, Elliot, and Kelsey for sharing Arlo with the University of South Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, the family of the late, great Hall of Famer, Arlo Elkins. Wow, what a night. This is, I'm in such awe standing here looking around this room. I, I've listened to everybody, and, and uh, this is an unbelievable evening for me. It's one I'm not going to forget. Um, I'm Arlo's brother, Dan, and uh, I, I just can't thank everybody enough for this whole evening. Humble is not a word that was very often associated with my brother. <laughs> but tonight, he would be humbled, he would be honored, he'd be thankful. Uh, this, is a, this is a dream come true for him. He... Uh, He's played tennis all of his life. I knew early on, by the way, that he was going to be a tennis player because when he was in Little League in baseball, he uh, got up to bat. He, could, he was barely big enough to hold the bat. He got up and a pitcher threw the first one and he swung and missed and threw the second one and he swung and missed again and he threw the third one and he swung and missed again and he came back dragging his bat and he said, how'd I do, coach? So I knew baseball wasn't going to be his sport. Um, Arlo played tennis uh, for years before he became the coach. He um, played in Wimbledon, he played in the French Open, he played in the Italian Open. He played tennis in, in uh, almost 60 countries professionally. And um, when he moved here, he, he moved here with his wife, and they're three kids, and they've got five beautiful grandkids. And he loved the university, he loved the athletic department, he loved the tennis program, he loved the girls that he helped nurture. Uh, Lisa, thank you for coming all the way from California tonight, one of the, one of the girls on his team. And uh, he would just want to say thank you so much to everybody who helped him along the way. And as everybody said, you know, it's not only athletes that need help, it's the coaches that need help too. And, and people in this room helped him, and you know who you are, and thank you so much. Uh, one of the great things that, that proves Arlo just loved the sport and loved this university is his headstone in Michigan has two cross tennis rackets with USC written under it. So he, he was a fan of this university. 
So on behalf of his entire family, I say thank you so much. unreal guy and an unreal coach and um, very proud to be a part of the USA Association of Letterman tonight and we could induct Arlo Elkins into the Hall of Fame. I want to remind uh, the inductees that uh, Alan Sharp's going to take some, some uh, group photos down here on this end before you get out of here. I hope you've gotten your football passes for the game. For everybody else's information, uh, the inductees will be introduced between the first and second quarter of the Vanderbilt game on Saturday night. It's been a great night. Uh, Jerry Fry men mentioned Coach Gizay, so I want you to I want you to remember in your prayers uh, Warren Gizay tonight. And a year ago tonight, at this microphone, Paul Dietzel was giving one of the most emotional acceptance speeches I've ever heard. And um, as you heard earlier from Coach Baker, he's not doing well at all. So I want you to remember Coach Dietzel and Coach Gizay and the family of our inductees who aren't with us tonight. And I want you to have a safe trip home and so much do we appreciate you being here tonight. Our induction class for 2013. Thank you for being here. <laughs>